Listen, it is hard to be a musician. It really is. You worked on Wonder Woman and Lion King, Inception, Top Gun, Dune, Dunkirk, and so many more. How does someone get to work on all of these films? YouTube, actually. <laughs> That's bananas. So I dropped out, didn't have much of a plan, and I found this garage on Craigslist. It was only 500 bucks a month, and I shared it with the car of the landlord. It was terrible. I'd be worried for you. People told me I was crazy, and then Hans Zimmer contacted me. If you got to make it, you got to make it, right? If you really want something desperately, you'll make it happen. Today, I speak with Tina Guo. We dig into why she defied everyone in her life. She dropped out of college and she openly shares how she earned her first million dollars. So Tina Guo, I am so curious. How does a classically trained celloist end up working with people like Hans Zimmer and be in the DC movie universe with Wonder Woman and all of this stuff? <laughs> Let me see. Uh, trying to be a rebel, rebellion you know, uh, against my classical upbringing. That's the very, very short version of it. <laughs> so, but, but I want to know actually, how does it happen? Like, how do you find yourself one day sitting in the studio going mm -hmm. like, okay, Tina, and I imagine like there's the glass and there's the producers or whatever. And they're like, uh, let's go ahead and do another one. And you're recording the soundtrack for like movie trailers and for films. And you're working with all these people in Hollywood. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. Um, YouTube, uh, actually, so <laughs> like very, YouTube, the answer for everybody. <laughs> it is, uh, the very first music video I released was back in 2009. So early days of YouTube. And at the time I was living in a garage, no heat, no air conditioning, no stove. I mean, it was times were times were hard. Right. And I had dropped out of school, dropped out of USC. I was on a full scholarship. Uh, I could go into so much detail on this, but I really, really, oh. really, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, <laughs> so you're you have no money you're no money. you're like sharing a garage you have no heat you have no stove you have no kitchen you've dropped out of school i had a um, toilet i mean i did have a toilet in a shower so that was <laughs> yeah but and we're going to get into your childhood story yeah uh in terms of your training in terms of your parents in terms of how you can like literally get as like world class as you are but so you have none of this stuff and it's 2009 okay go on yeah. So at that point, I dropped out of school for a couple of years. Right. And I had this psychotic dream of wanting to be an industrial metal cello player, electric cello player. Actually, you can see it behind me right there. That's uh, one of my original electric cellos. I don't usually play that one anymore, but it's uh, right behind me. And so coming from a classical background, I think I just felt so repressed in a lot of ways, you know, as a person artistically. And I was always really attracted to like really dark, heavy, probably just angry music. As you can see, I'm not a very angry person anymore for the most part, but there's some kind of like beast inside for sure. Um, and at that point, I just really, really wanted to do something different. I felt like I was born, you know, uh, into the family trade, which I was, I was forced to practice. Like I had no choice. That was the only thing I could do was to play classical cello because both my parents are music teachers and they forced me to practice every day, eight to 10 hours every single day, seven days a week since I, you know, started the instrument. So I don't know. I just really had a lot of, uh, pent up things and aggression and stuff like that. So, uh, Long story short, I had a lot of trouble like trying to make enough money while I was in school, even though I had a um, full scholarship. It doesn't cover, you know, books, living expenses, which is very expensive at a school like USC and every other college. So I was starting to perform as a classical musician. I did some tour. I did some small tours of small orchestras, but I had to leave for like three weeks at a time. And of course, I was failing all my classes because if you're not around uh, to learn any of the stuff, you start failing. So my college advisor said, listen, you have to either stay in school to keep your scholarship, but then I wouldn't be able to afford, you know, to eat or to live there. The college advisor, bless her, I'm not going to mention her by name, said, you know, your career is always going to be there waiting for you, but college won't. And I thought, isn't it the opposite? <laughs> and because she said that in that moment, I'm like, that's it. I'm dropping out because that literally makes yeah, no sense. There, I mean, that, I that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I mean, I understand they're paying your salary, you know, but that that does not make any sense. So hold on, um, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's park here for a second. She said, that your career is always going to be waiting for you, but college won't. I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, a rare, rare opportunity. You know, the honor of attending USC. No offense to USC, of course. No, 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 no. I know. No, yeah, no offense yeah. to any college, but I yeah. actually heard a conversation between Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss talking about why Ryan Holiday, the the author of you know Obstacles Away and other stuff, but he dropped out of college, and what he was told when he was facing the decision to drop out of college was. <laughs> 
no one actually officially drops out of college. You take mm-hmm. a leave of absence. You take a leave of absence because in, in truth, when it's something doesn't work out in six months or a year or two years, you can always go back. Right. And Will Smith, you know, when he decided not to go to college, but to pursue rapping because his parents wanted him to go there, mm-hmm. he got a year. They got the college to extend his opportunity for a year and he had a year mm-hmm. to make it work. I have mm-hmm. never heard anyone give the advice that you have to go to college now. That is, that's bananas. Yeah. And you know what? I, I guess I technically am still on a leave of absence, just in perpetuity, you know. <laughs> Except for you went back and got an undergrad and a master's degree somewhere, right? Oh, oh it, it's something completely unrelated. That was a, oh, that okay. was something different. While I'm on tour with the circus, so that's that's a different story. But as far as like classical cello performance, you know, formal training. Um, so I, you know, I dropped out, didn't have much of a plan, you know, so bounced around living in really weird places. And I found this garage on Craigslist. It was only 500 bucks a month, which was you know, barely affordable for me, but I'm like, okay. And you mentioned a shared garage. That's right. I shared it with the car of the landlord. So the car was in the other half. There was this like plastic partition. Literally, it was like a plastic thing. It was it was terrible. I probably... How did you... Uh, hold on. You were a young woman at the time. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. so you, <laughs> you get a $500 garage rental off of Craigslist. That's a safe thing to do, eh? Listen, I've done a lot of things in my life that I'm I'm happy I'm alive and <laughs> I've been very lucky. Um, but I really don't like excuses. So when people I, you know, sometimes I, oh. I do have like, yeah, I don't like excuses. People say, oh, but it's difficult, or oh, this circumstance or that circumstance. I mean, there's some things I'm not even gonna I feel like I'm too young to mention the things that I've done to like, you know, out of desperation. So I'm not gonna say some of the things I've done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you, a note and later, yeah. <laughs> later, let's <laughs> later. see if we can't pull those out of you. No, it's like, if you really want something desperately, you'll make it happen, you know, and it might take a while. It might be very roundabout. So anyway, I found this garage and I have been living there for over a year. Um, and oh, my, my uh, next door neighbor, there's an actual guest house on the property. This is in Sun Valley. So like really far up North in the LA area, kind of like farmland. So a lot of horses and cows and stuff. And he, um, very nice guy, but he was a uh, convicted, he, he was convinced uh, he was very open about it. So for armed robbery. So that was like my, my neighbor. Um, okay. so it was, it was a really interesting, interesting time in my life. And how did, I just, it, how did it, if we can park there for a second, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I think a lot of us, especially my, I feel this way mm-hmm. all the time. Like I, f- I feel this way today, even it always feels like we haven't arrived at the place we want to be. Yeah. And so I can just imagine, you know, you're for a year, You've taken a leave of absence from school. I'll call it that. But you've dropped out of school. You've done some touring. You're barely getting by. It's five hundred dollars a month. You're a classically trained celloist. Mm-hmm. And, and I've heard you say that you know you could always have chosen to audition for like a symphony or an orchestra and gone kind mm-hmm. of the the mm-hmm. classic way. But mm-hmm. but what did it feel like during that year for you? Did you feel like you were making progress? Did it feel like life was slipping by? What did it feel like? Well, it was actually uh, almost two years by the point. I, <laughs> cause, uh, I dropped out in 2007. Um, yeah. And then it wasn't until the end of 2009. So I, I remember that was almost two years. And Two uh, years. Two years. And I felt like I felt desperate, right? And I didn't have a lot of work. I was doing, uh, you know, like these concerts that I mentioned, that's only like once or twice a year, like a few shows. So it's not really, you have a lot of time, but it's good to have a lot of time because you ruminate and you think about things and you plan. Um, so I, w- I was practicing that I have to say during that time in my life, I was practicing eight hours a day. I had a routine. I was still smoking cigarettes, not anymore, but I would practice <laughs> for 50 minutes so five zero, 50 minutes, and then a 10 minute coffee and cigarette break. So I would do that eight times a day. So eight cigarettes and eight cups of coffee a day. And that was like my morning routine from six in the morning until, you know, and then I would eat something really, really fast. It's also very thin. It's, it's good to be poor. You can't afford to eat stuff. <laughs> And is this when you learned the electric cello? Because I I, I do know that moving from a classic cello, which is like, Mm -hmm. I guess, like an acoustic guitar um, to an electric cello that's more like an electric guitar, but without Mm -hmm. frets. Yeah, exactly. So it's really, it's a hard transition to make. And and I've heard you say it took you two years just to learn this. Is that kind of that two-year window? No. So I, I started experimenting when I was like maybe 19 years old. So in my second year of college before I dropped out. Um, okay. So yeah, so I purchased an instrument. My first electric cello, it's from Yamaha also. It kind of looks like this, but I actually had to sell it on Craigslist because I couldn't afford to pay my rent. So I ended up selling that cello for a while. I didn't have an electric cello. It was during that period that I was practicing eight hours a day on the classical cello. So only classical practice and then trying to experiment. And I would go to Guitar Center, you know, like guys would go there and like kind of shred. I'd bring my 
my electric cello and try to, cause I couldn't afford any pedals or amps. So I would like try to like try out stuff and practice there. It sounded terrible. I was, it was terrible. It was really horrendous. You know, did it, did um, it hurt you to be that bad knowing how good you could be <laughs> on a classical one? No, no, it wasn't really that by bad. I think it's more, it's not really the technical stuff. Cause that's the same. Like if you're a classical guitar player, of course you could pick up an electric guitar and just shred on it, but it's more of like the tone of it. I think that's the biggest thing. Cause it can, it doesn't sound very good. So it takes a lot of tweaking. It's more of like on the, not the mechanical side, but it's definitely not necessarily what your fingers are doing, but getting like the right tone and then also developing a different way of playing. So it's like an opera singer. If you try to sing, I don't know, some metal song, you can't, I mean, I guess there is like opera metal, but it's a very different way of using your voice. So it's the same thing. It's a completely different playing technique. And then also I thought I want to play standing up. So that really changes kind of the aerodynamics of everything. So it took, it definitely took a while, but during this period, you know, I was doing all this for a couple of years. I got most of my gigs off Craigslist. I was playing a lot of, thank God, but I was playing a lot of weddings, a lot of funerals, actually. Sadly, cello is like a, you know, it's a sad instrument. So a lot of funerals, a lot of bar mitzvahs, like just all over town. I was playing with like anyone who would pay me basically like 50 bucks a show, sitting with them, like on the sunset strip. I've played in every club, every like little, so I was just, it was intense and it had been two years and I thought, okay, this is not working. So like you mentioned earlier about orchestras, I thought, okay, maybe my parents are right. Maybe I made a huge mistake and I should audition for, uh, there's an opening in the San Diego Symphony, which is where I grew up in San Diego. My parents live there. I think it paid like maybe like 40,000 or something a year at the time, but there's health insurance, you know, you're like a real employee. Um, and I'm like 40,000. That is like an astronomical amount of money. I couldn't even imagine fathom, you know, making that much a year. And I'm like, Oh boy, you know, that's really like, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I was just being silly. So I thought, okay, my last hurrah before I not really give up. It's not that I hate classical music. I just really, um, well, actually no, people would tell me I was delusional. So like you're delusional. You're even my parents, like your heads up in the clouds. Like you think you're to be some something special like you need to just calm down and you know do what you're supposed to do um but i had this like i don't know this fantasy in my mind i'm like i really wish i could be basically like an electric star player you know and i i would like imagine flash, myself right yeah, you wanted flash. to be it flash like, yes it was flash <laughs> can't um, you just picture him right it's november rain it's the music video and he's <laughs> out by the church you know like or yeah. whatever in the field <laughs> Yeah, it's just no, it's just so epic, and there's so much. I, maybe it's like masculine energy, but it's, there's just so much like power and dominance, and like I I do have that inside me too. You know, sometimes I say I think I was a man in a past life because I have a lot of that like aggressive like maybe primal energy, and like that's not classical music is not very conducive to expressing that side. I think because uh, all types of music are good, and I think better suited for expressing different things. So I had a lot of that, and then I just thought, you know what, I need to just do something like one thing. So I can maybe show my grandkids one day, like, oh, look at your grandma when she was in her early 20s. And then I would go and do my audition. I already prepared, even paid for some extra lessons from somebody like a member of the LA Phil. And so I thought, all right, I want to make a music video and put it up on this new YouTube thingy. And maybe if I'm really lucky, like Rammstein or Marilyn Manson or Metallica or like, you know, some industrial, industrial metal band uh, would see it. And then they'll whisk me away and I'll be saved for my life and I'll go on tour. I didn't know how things worked. You know, I, I thought that could happen, which actually it could happen. It can't, it can't happen. So I took all the money that I had at the time and I think it was like about around 2000, which is, I mean, that's a lot of money that I had scrounged and saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you're, when you're paying $6,000 a year in rent and you're scraping to get by and selling yeah. cellos and all this to make it, yeah. $2,000 is a lot yeah. of money. Listen, it is hard to be a musician. It really is. You know, it's not, I mean, you are an entrepreneur, you know, at, at a very low level, micro level, micro entrepreneur, but it's it's hard uh, starting out. So I pulled a lot of favors. I mean, it wouldn't have been able to happen without some you know, friends definitely helping. I even have friends like bring like food to the set just because I couldn't afford it. Like, you know, buy water for the crew or whatnot. So it really was a big team effort. And then we shot it in the warehouse for coffin case. I don't know if uh, you've heard of that, but they make like the coffin shaped guitar cases. So Johnny, he's like the owner of the company at the time. And I was like, like calling everybody just, begging, just begging him, please. Yeah. Yeah. And he was so kind. He's like, well, I don't, he's like, you can shoot it in the factory. Like if you want, there's a lot of boxes everywhere, but you can probably like figure something out. So if you look really carefully, like in the background, it's all, all like cardboard boxes to were like in the factory. And yeah. So I, anyway, I did it. It took about six months of pre-production. I met a amazing uh, Rich Ragsdale. I will always be grateful to him and his team. Uh, I met him doing another music video that I was hired. I think I was paying like a hundred bucks to be in that video. 
and we started talking. He's really into horror. So he makes like horror films uh, and like dark stuff. And I I was telling him my crazy stuff. Oh, I, I have this vision of a music video uh, for Queen Bee. So it's a metal version of the flight of Bumblebee. I know it's been done before, but I thought, you know what? Like in my mind, I'm like for marketing, I'm like, I can play really, really fast. And like, that's probably something that'll get people's attention, you know, because it's like a technical thing and shredding. Um, and so maybe I'll just do a dark version. But in my mind, I wanted a hundred male extras because you know in a hive there's a queen bee <laughs> this is not ego this is scientific accuracy right so <laughs> one 100 male extras uh, covered in gold body paint writhing around on the floor <laughs> Naked. So, so central <laughs> casting, you don't have the budget for that, right? <laughs> no, I wanted them all naked, right? Like I own a production company other. as well, so uh, I can, uh-huh. as soon as like if you were my client, I would say uh-huh. I would say, do you realize the transportation fees? Do you realize <laughs> the, the 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 craft services fees? Like even if yeah. we're not paying for these extras, like yeah. getting a hundred people in through hair and makeup at fifteen yeah. minutes per thing, like like I yeah. could just break down how crazy this is. I love yeah. it so much. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, I I want that and because it needs to be accurate. And we built this giant beehive out of paper mache, like life, life size. So it was like all the way up to here and I came out of it. And I was also nude, uh, except I had some, you know, I was covering gold body paint, and like nipple plates, like all of this very, it wasn't about like trying to be like sexually seductive or anything like that. I just thought like bees don't wear clothing. So I'm just trying to, you know, this is like an artistic <laughs> <laughs> representation. And, you know, we worked on it and then quickly realized that I could not afford um, any extras, of course. So in that scene in the middle of the video, there's there's nobody, it's just me, but that's okay. It's an empty hive. Everybody's out gathering, you know, doing yeah, whatever yeah, they're they all, do. They're, they're all working for you, right? They're so, working, so here, yeah. Here's, mm-hmm. Here's what I love so much, because if we were to reverse engineer, right. you have a song that you're like, well, I know it's been done, but, but yeah. that means it's kind of popular and people uh, know exactly. it and that's cool. And you're yeah. like, I'm going to do it differently. And I really, I really have this creative idea and everyone's saying that I'm crazy and I really want all of these things to happen. It just sounds like internet gold. I mean, it sounds like <laughs> your intuition of all of this quote unquote delusional stuff that you wanted yeah. to do, that you wanted to pursue were, mm-hmm. were little bits and pieces of all the things that you found interesting. Yeah. And yet mm-hmm. all of your training and all of the people in your life have just this really square idea Mm -hmm. of what you need to do. And you're like, I want to just break free of that. I want to do something totally different. And that drive, that desire, that push, six months of pre-pro, all of this stuff Mm -hmm. is is actually what pushed you more into the limelight, right? Like it wouldn't have stood out if, if you just, I don't know, lit a few candles and were sitting in a church playing an old cello, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, people can only see what you show them. So everyone thinks something can't be done, obviously, until you do it. So I think in my mind, yeah, and and I just, I don't know, like, for some people, uh, everyone's different. I think in my nature, maybe I am a little bit of a, I don't want to say contrarian, but if someone tells me that I can't do something or I shouldn't do something, I mean, I think a lot of people are like this. It just really makes me help it on doing the complete opposite and shoving it in your face. (laughs) Yeah, like, (laughs) get a you right so um I, I i think a lot of my initial drive like in my first like decade i mean i'm 37 now you know i'm turning 38 this year but like in my first decade of it like really this the struggle to like clawing your way like your nails are like bloody and you're bleeding just like trying to just make that i was fueled by not revenge like i don't think that's the right word but there's a lot of that trying to like prove something and i think i mean yeah. i think a lot of people can relate to that i'm yeah. sure so, um, so so for listeners I, we're still on question one i mean i know oh, i keep sorry, peppering I you with, no much. oh my gosh no not okay. you i just okay. want to say like like the, the question is how does someone get to work on all of these films and wonder woman and stuff like that this is not you this is because i'm so curious about the details and so yeah. it's it's 2009 you make this music video uh what happens next Okay, so Metallica, Rammstein, and Marilyn Manson, none of them see it, of course, right? (laughs) You're waiting by the phone. You're like, you know, this is in the land. This is the days of home phones, I guess, right? (laughs) Or maybe your garage didn't no. have a phone, but <laughs> no, no, I, I I did have a cell phone, one of those flip, uh, like a Nokia flip phone. I did have that. I remember. Yes, I was waiting. I was waiting by my email. Uh, nothing arrived. But uh, two weeks after the video was released on my YouTube channel, uh, let's see what I think. John Debney, so the composer for Passion of the Christ, he was working on Iron Man two at the time. So he contacted me. Brian Tyler uh, contacted me, and then Hans Zimmer contacted me. So literally, it was three of the biggest composers in Hollywood 
all within the same week. And at the time, like I had done a little bit of floor work because when you're in LA, I feel like everybody's somehow involved in the industry. Um, and as a student at USC, like I did some small sessions, a few sessions for like student composers. So I was I was familiar with, you know, with that, but it wasn't really something I was trying to do. You know, if I got called for called for something, I would do it, but it was more of like a way to make money. You know, I just thought of it as like a employment, you know, option, but I really didn't think about that as like a, I don't know, I guess the direction that I would have gone in the future. So I think it's always good to remain open. You don't know how things will arrive because in the end I did end up getting to play very aggressive metal music, but not in the way that I thought it was going to happen. So I, I recorded on Iron Man 2 soundtrack. It's on YouTube somewhere, like the actual recording sessions with uh, John and I. There's two of those videos uh, live. So I just improvised like my parts. And then Hans was working on uh, Sherlock Holmes at the time. That was the first thing that we worked on together. So we did Sherlock Holmes and then Inception. And he was shown my music video for Queen Bee by a friend of mine. Um, and I had met her, oh my God, also on a YouTube related thing. It was a YouTube My Grammy Moment Contest. I think, I don't remember what year, 2008 maybe or something. Uh, it was just like a contest where you would upload a 60 second cover of the Foo Fighters the, uh, Pretender. Like it was the year when that was like super huge. <laughs> yeah. So I met her doing the contest and we were like um, in the top finalists. So they, well, flew us to LA. I was already in LA. Um, and so she was at a party met Hans. And then he was saying something like, oh, I'm looking for like a new cellist. And she's like, oh my God, this like girl that I met, my friend Tina, like she just released this crazy, you know, video and she showed it to him. And, you know, he found it interesting and liked it. Cause I think Hans is a big fan of people who are, or artists who are like, uh, not weird, that's not the right word, but have like a very unique voice, you know? Yeah, let's go with um, weird. <laughs> weird, okay, weird or different. Um, and so that's how we actually started working together. So Wonder Woman was like, I don't even know how many projects, that was like a, over a decade later, but we worked on a lot of projects together. Um, and that's been like an ongoing relationship for 12 years now. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this is mm -hmm. so... If I think we were pitching this as a movie people would be like, I think we need to tone this down a bit because it's just, <laughs> these, these types of things don't happen. And so I have, I have a few questions around this time, but mm -hmm. did you, did it, did it, does it feel like the good old days looking back or were you like, Oh, hell, I never want to do that again. No, no, no. no uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think, I think it, um, no, I mean, sometimes like I do think back and it's like, you know, I, I, I'm very driven by my artistic goals, but I always say I'm like half robot. I'm like, half and half. And I'm very driven by money, uh, to be honest, you know, because it was uh, money for me equals freedom, security, both two things I, I never had, you know, growing up and that I really, really wanted to have for myself. And my best friend, her name is also Tina. So, um, and <laughs> she likes to remind me, we're still best friends. We met in middle school and she likes to remind me that even back in like seventh grade when we met, I don't remember saying this, but she's like, no, I swear you would say this all the time. Like, I want to be a millionaire. And I'm like, I'm kind of, at first I was embarrassed by that. I'm like, Shh, don't tell anyone that. Cause that's like, I don't want people to think that I'm like really into money or something. But then I thought, why is that such a bad thing? Why, why is it embarrassing to want to better yourself and to further yourself and to, you know, be able to, I don't know, buy, not shop in the clearance aisle of uh, Ralph's, which is where I used to always, I would only buy stuff that was on sale or free. Cause it was like expired and stuff. So I think coming from that like unpleasant way of life. It yeah. just really, really made me hyper-focused on wanting to have better, a better life and have better things. And also to have the freedom to do what I want musically. Because if you aren't dependent, if you're not a slave to whatever system, you can express yourself in whatever way you want. So I think those are very uh, closely correlated together, but I don't remember what your question was. I'm just going off no, on a tangent. No, I was, but <laughs> no, that's cool. I was, you know, so this whole idea of, of on one side, pushing the artistic side of things, Mm -hmm. And then the other side, knowing that it needs to be able to pay off. And what makes you so unique is, you know, you are an entrepreneur and you do have um, product lines and and you've expanded mm -hmm. in, into all kinds of, you know, I, I believe you own a consultancy or, you know, there's there's all these different things that you're doing. But when you look at an opportunity today, do you always balance it to what can I do to push this for maybe viewability or to stand out or to be different or to have something to say or or I know that if I do this, this is going to be internet gold and it's going to give me more exposure. It's going to like, are you quite strategic on the artistic side because the want of, of money and wealth and independence and control and all those other things or do they come together or is there this wall between them? No, I think it's definitely together. You know, I always had that goal of being a self-made millionaire and I, I uh, am very grateful that I did it some uh, some years back. And I think obviously it's not the same. You know, when I was in seventh grade, having a million dollars is not the same as it is today in 2023, but it did give me How like old a were feeling. You? How old were you when you hit that? 
uh, I was, this was like maybe five years ago. So not that long ago. I was 32. So it took me, it actually took me. What did that feel like? Uh, I think I allowed myself to like be happy. I think I danced around in my office, my small office, uh, in the condo I used to live in for like 10 minutes. And then right back to work. All right, next goal. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought, and I thought, all right, how do I get to 10? Right. This is, I don't know. I just enjoy it. How do I get to 10? So that's the next goal. (laughs) That's the next goal. Yeah. And and I, for me, it's the same thing as practice. You know, it's exactly the same as practicing your instrument because you put in hours, obsessive focus, you know, you analyze how to play. Like some people, you know, when you say practice, you're not just sitting there noodling around. Like for me, I will go in, I will analyze every single note, but this is just so it can be natural later, but you analyze every single note, what fingering, every pop, like, so sometimes I'll spend two hours on just one bar of music. So maybe four notes, five notes, and I'll like just analyze it over and over and over and over try every possible scenario of how to travel from one, one note to another, how it's going to sound. And then once I get that, then I extend it one bar. So everything is very methodical. And I actually think that's the same thing when it comes to building anything, like being super, super methodical, starting, you know, one, uh, not going from, you can have a bigger vision and say, I want to go from here to there, but it doesn't happen that way. You know, you don't go from zero to a million. So every goal before that, it was much smaller. I remember at one point I told myself like, my God, if I had $10,000 in my bank account, like I would be like, I would feel so confident. I wouldn't be worried. I could pay my rent for like a year. Like I'd be baller. Like that would be badass, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. So and practice is the same, you know, like to get to a level where you have text, uh, technical dexterity, where you're able to play anything that's put in front of you. You know, what they say, like if you're a shredder or whatnot, it doesn't just happen. It's like very, very methodical, you know, very obsessive. So it's actually the same. So I think a lot of the principles, I think building wealth, building whatever a career, you know, it's all, to me, it's very analytical and it's the same as the technical aspect of playing music. But then once the technical part is there, so once the machine is like working, you're not limited by your, um, by your own capabilities of doing whatever, then you can express yourself. And I can use that without even thinking about it mentally, like to express like emotion and feeling and passion and like whatever else, you know, we're trying yeah. to. So when yeah. it comes to your career or even wealth, you mm-hmm. know, what took you from, what were your steps that you broke down? You, you talked about that bar of music. Mm-hmm. that you would break down and you just working through the notes to get the sound, to get the muscle memory. So what took mm-hmm. you from zero to 10,000, from 10,000 to whatever the next step is, maybe 50 or 100, and from 100 to 500 and 500 to a million? Mm-hmm. What, did, did, did you look at it that way? Or did yeah. you just focus on the, the actions and then suddenly one day you're like, oh, no, here's a million no, dollars? <laughs> no, no. I mean, every, different things I'm sure happen to different people. But for me, yeah, everything's extremely analytical and it took a long time to get there i mean it was not until i was 32 so that was like yeah well, it was will, well over I, a decade you know I, I will just say for our listeners who mm-hmm. are super impressed with with what you've done i i've done some quick math you're 33 years into your your musical training right like you started yeah. when you were three playing piano right yeah three years old yeah so 33 years into into it. So it's not like this just happened overnight right no 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 yeah many many hours but um I, uh, wait, what were we talking about? Uh, how... We're talking about how, how did you go from zero to a million then? If, you were, if you're this analytical, what were those yeah. steps for you? Yeah, so the micro steps, right? I, I, so this, this was the period right after I did uh, the music video. I came out, I started getting more work and it was good. And I remember I upgraded to uh, a studio apartment in Canoga Park um, that was 650 a month. I remember like all the numbers. I remember what I spent on everything, 650 a month. But I think my total expenditure at the time was probably under 1200 a month. I just kept all my costs really, really low. I still wasn't making very much, but a little bit more, right? And I just, you just have to be really careful about what your spending is. Um, and I still do this. So every single day uh, I have my, just, I use Google spreadsheets. I know there's probably other ways to do it, but for me, I like to manually type everything in, even though it can all be automated, of course. Um, so uh, uh, like, even if it's one cent, literally anything that comes in, if I find a penny on the ground or anything that goes out, I track it. And it's, it's also like instant bookkeeping, right? My accountant, I think is like happy that I'm so organized financially too, but it's like anything that I make, uh, it's all categorized as pretty like for taxes and write-offs and stuff like that. So I do that every single morning. Uh, I haven't done that yet today because we're speaking, but I'm going to do it after. Uh-huh. And it's a process that I like. I really like it because I like to be aware of like what's going on the same way I track my sleep on my Apple Watch. I track like just everything is like data, you know, that I like to track and I analyze it, and, like see what, how it affects my performance. So I started off just spending as little as possible, but I have to say that the biggest leap that really, really um, helped me financially, because I had a lot of debt 
I bought my classical cello, which is in this case. Um, I, it was during, uh, there's some kind of like, it wasn't the big, big financial crash, but it was a period where like the value of a lot of like assets, including fine instruments went down. Yeah. So that cello is from 1878. So maybe- so maybe like yeah. 2001, like there was that little micro recession after September 11th and things like that. Or, yeah, or later? I think, yeah, I think it was around that period. Um, yeah. Cause at the time I couldn't afford, I, I tried to get a loan for the cello. I couldn't afford it. I was looking uh, to find um, like sponsors. What does, a cello, what does a cello cost? Uh, I mean, all the way up to $5 million, you know, for, for a cello, <laughs> but, but no, this one is not like, I own it outright. Thank God now. But when I bought it, it was on sale um, for 65,000, which was $65,000. Was- <laughs> Yeah. And like, that was like a really, uh, a really good deal, but of course I couldn't afford it. So I went to the musicians union to try to get a loan, which I didn't qualify because my income, you know, was nothing. Was, yeah, it was nothing. <laughs> um, and so at the time I had gotten, I think I had like four different credit cards. So like the limits were very, very low, but I, you know, the cash advance checks and they, of course there's like interest on them. So I used all of the cash advance checks. I went back to the musicians union. I spoke to the lady, the very nice lady who was in charge of like uh, instrument loans because they specialize in that. And I begged her and I said, let me, it is collateral. And I'm like, look at the actual you know, an insurance valuation, you would instantly make a lot more of something were to happen if I default on the loan. So I ended up getting the loan, even though I didn't qualify for it. And I went back many, many times and called her many times to get it on top of the, I guess, the down payment that I made using four different, maxing out four credit cards. So anyway, it was, it was really because I had a lot of debt. And then also when I was in school, like I mentioned earlier, I was doing some shows to pay for food, to pay for books, to pay for the dorm, which uh, I think it was it was $800 a month, which is actually even more than the garage, you know, the dorm on campus. Because I didn't have a car, so I couldn't like live off campus. So I lived on campus. And I ended up... Do you think I was these like, types of situations force mm-hmm. you to get creative, force yes. you to get scrappy, yes. force you to kind of like, yes. if you got to make it, you got to make it, right? Exactly. If, if things are too easy, like I, I, like 100%, things are given to you. I mean, it's not even your fault. It's like, you don't know what it's like to have to figure things out for yourself, you know? So so I, I'm grateful for that whole entire situation and everything. So uh, I was over 100,000, six figures in debt. Um, and I was just making, barely making like minimum payments on everything at the time. Obviously, I was also living in the garage. I was trying to live as cheaply as possible. But even then, like I, I was selling things. I remember I was um, also on Craigslist. Like I would try to find things and negotiate with people. Like I, I bought this really old like MacBook that somebody had cracked, and there were all like every software program on it. And I like made. I remember with that one, I was really excited. I made like three hundred bucks every night because I bought it and then sold it immediately <laughs> to somebody else. I mean, <laughs> I was really just trying to do whatever I could to to make a buck, you know? And so at that time, uh, I was living in Canoga Park in the studio apartment, but which I felt was pretty fancy because I actually had a kitchen. And then I got a call uh, from on my cell phone and I looked at it and it was from Montreal. And I'm like, I'm not answering that because at the time, like if it was an international number, you'd have to pay for it. It was like 20 cents a minute. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going <laughs> to 20 cents. Like that's not good. So I did an answer and they left a voicemail and it was Cirque du Soleil. I mean, it was a circus, like it's completely random. And so they had seen my music video on YouTube, the same video. That music video has, yes, has opened that, a lot of really doors for you. Off. It did, it did. <laughs> and then after that, there are some other like classical videos. I started doing some other ones, um, but it wasn't, I still didn't have a lot of content. It was just that there's some like concert footage. Uh, there's a classical video that I did. And so they asked me, they're like, we saw your, so I never auditioned. They said, we saw your videos on YouTube and there's three shows uh, that we're in pre-production for. We'd like to offer you a position. I'm like, really? Like, you know, what are these shows? And so there was the Michael Jackson, The Immortal World Tour, which is the one I ended up on. It's an arena tour playing the electric cello, playing like, I mean, it's like Michael Jackson's music, but kind of like rock, pop, rock music. Um, but it would be the electric cello. Obviously, he didn't have electric cello. It would be playing like the guitar parts. And I thought, oh my God, like people told me I was crazy. You can't play electric cello and like shred in an arena. Like, are you insane? Like, that's just not going to happen. And that's, you know, so there was that one. And the two other shows, yeah. Amaluna, which yeah. is like an all-female show, whatever, like the other stuff, you know? So, so because because as you're telling the story, you know, buying the $65,000 cello and $100,000 mm-hmm. in debt and scraping mm-hmm. to get by and two or three years of going in on other stuff, in my head, I'm thinking, if you were my sister, if you were my daughter, if you were my mm-hmm. friend, mm-hmm. I think... Think I would be in the your delusional camp, and yeah, and, yeah, I, and I and I'm the guy yeah. I'm the guy who wants to rally creatives <laughs> and entrepreneurs to take the risks you're taking. But I yeah. think I would really struggle to be like, I, I'd be worried for you. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would. No, I would too. And I think that the thing is, you have to look at somebody's actions and their thought process. So if I was in this whole situation, and I wasn't, you know, waking up every day, five, six in the morning, like practicing every day, being very analytical about and like trying everything. And also at the time you're in your early 20s. So I'm like, uh, like I can probably still audition and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I definitely, like I mentioned earlier, like almost gave up because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Maybe I am crazy. Um, but I was not, I definitely was not expecting um, that call from Cirque. And I remember I had just finished filming the first episode of America's Got Talent. So that was another thing that they like contacted me. So I, uh, I filmed it and then I'm like, okay, do I take a contract with the circus or do I do America's Got Talent? And of course I'm going to take the contract because they offered, they were offering 3,500 a week. And I'm like, 3,500 a week. Yeah. I mean, that was like, wow. that was a lot, right? <laughs> Plus like really good, you know, Cigna health insurance. And it was a three-year contract. So quickly I calculated, like if I, obviously there's taxes, but you know, if I save like everything, I could pay off all my debt. I can actually like start saving. I've always wanted to start investing, but I didn't have any money to invest, you know? So I took the contract uh, and then I went to Montreal and then I was on that tour for two years. And at the time that I was on tour, I thought, oh my God, you know, when the, the universe has given me like some kind of like gift and, and to reward me. So I better not waste this opportunity. I have to be really careful. Um, cause I remember like a lot of, you know, people get excited when they first start making money and they spend it immediately, you know, lifestyle inflation. Um, and for me, I was lucky because when you're on tour, they pay for all your living expenses because you're living out of hotels. So I immediately got rid of everything. The only thing I kept was my car, which was paid off. It was like a, a salvage title that I got at some really shady dealership. So that was, you know, that was a <laughs> I was parked at my parents' house. Um, I actually got rid of my cell phone plan because I'm like, I'm not going to pay like 50 bucks a month for a phone. That's like a waste of money. Not good because like I, I probably needed a phone you at some point. And you lost your you lost your contact number. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I had like the phone. So if you were signed into Wi-Fi, you could like use like, you know, okay. like WhatsApp or whatever. I mean, it was, yeah. And so I spent $20 a week. And I know that this is only possible because I was on a tour. So usually, you know, all your meals, like sometimes breakfast is included at the hotels. And then when you do a show, you know, there's catering and I would not steal, but I would take, you know, some food from, from craft services, which is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then like it's it's there, it's just sitting there, there. you know, you might as well flip it into your purse or your (laughs) cello bag. Yeah. And I like basically lived off of like power bars and stuff like that on the days that we weren't doing shows. Once in a while, I remember it's like really if like to, to treat myself, I would order room service, but I was only, I would only get the soup because it was usually like cheap. It was like a, you know, appetizer, 10, $15, maybe if it's at like a nicer hotel and then ask for extra bread. I was just like, eat. I mean, this is so sad, but like, I would just eat like all this bread. And like, I was just really trying, like, I'm like, I'm not going to spend over $20 a week. I'm not, I'm going to pay off all my debt, all of it. And then I'm going to start saving. Then I'm going to learn how to invest because I heard from people, you know, who seem fancy and they're like talking about stocks and stuff. Like I want to learn how that works. So I took a course from T- uh, TD Ameritrade, you know, it was free about, about stocks. So I, I thought, oh, this is actually not very complicated at all. You know, there, it's not complicated that the actual, like to understand what it is, because I think everything seems scary. And then like, okay, that's really not complicated. So I did that. And then I started investing uh, like five, it was $5 a week. I started putting into just, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yes. That is so cool. Now, all I'm hearing from you is like Mm -hmm. focus, discipline, focus, Mm -hmm. discipline, sacrifice, take risks, put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. If we go back to your childhood, if we go back to, you know, when, when you first got into music, you you did not <laughs> you did not get to pick you know mm-hmm. what career was originally and you didn't get to pick what you were going to spend all your time doing you know it was forced mm-hmm. upon you yeah. but it sounds like you learned that discipline and that focus when you were young and i i want to hear about that time in your life yeah. and it also sounds like it helped strengthen your rebellious streak to take all these risks so yeah. what happened when you were so young Okay, so I was born in China, in Shanghai, in the year 1985. (laughs) Made in China. Uh, And my parents, uh, they were, they met when they were both in the army, in the army orchestra, because they grew up during the communist revolution. And so they met, and then they had the opportunity to study in America. So my college professor uh, for cello, Eleanor Schoenfeld, this incredible German lady, when I studied with her, she was already, I think, 85 years old. Um, And so she actually taught my father as well. And she and her sister, Alice and Eleanor, they were legendary um, classical music teachers, violin and cello. So they would 
go to China at the time on like talent expedition things because it's very, very difficult uh, if you're in China at the time, obviously during communist times and post-communism to come to America. I mean, that's everybody's dream, you know, everywhere. Um, you need a sponsor, you know, it costs a lot of money. And so uh, she saw my dad play a recital in Shanghai um, and then sponsored him out. So my father left when I was, I think I was six months old. Uh, I had just been born. So he went to America to go to college. Uh, and then my mom left when I was a year and a half. So my grandparents, actually, my mom's parents raised me until I was uh, about five and a half years old. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I actually, I remember, like, I think my earliest memory, I was maybe two and a half. Like, I remember, um, I, I was always, uh, well, first of all, I was really fat because I ate a lot. I, I do love to eat. That's a side note. <laughs> my grandparents fed me a lot. But I always uh, remember, like, pretending to, like, call my parents. I had a toy phone. And I have a picture of it. I would like, I remember like wanting to be with them. And so I think there's some sense of like um, abandonment, you know, from a very young age, uh, even though I wasn't maybe fully, you know, conscious of it at the time. Um, well, yeah, and then, I mean, that's, that's really hard for, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, talk about scary as hell for your parents. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but, yeah. But hard, hard for you, you know, you're there with your right. grandparents and your parents are off, right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, like, you don't know, like the reasons behind things when you're a kid. And so finally, at age five and a half, um, we got like a, they, I think my parents were trying to get me some kind of visa, but they weren't able to. So I actually came to America on a visitor's visa. And I was technically, I mean, I'm just going to say illegal for, for quite a while because I came on a visitor's visa as uh, at five and a half. I stayed with my parents like in their apartment in Connecticut and just like didn't leave. Um, and it wasn't, I'll get to that later. It wasn't until later due to some like special like talent thing. Like when I was a kid, I mean, then, then I was able to get a citizenship, but I was literally an illegal alien for, for until I was like 13 years old. And so I came out to Connecticut. And at the time I only played piano. So I started piano when I was three. Um, and then my parents immediately started basically saying you have to practice. So I think it started off at five years old. It was maybe five or six hours a day uh, on the piano. And then I started playing the violin, which my mom is a violin teacher. I was terrible at it, like no talent at all. And then I switched over to cello when I was seven. And at age seven, we had moved to San Diego. So that's where my parents still are. Um, Walk me through a typical day. You know, so I have four kids. Yeah. I have an eight-year-old. She's in competitive dance. And mm -hmm. it's hard to get her to practice, right? Like it's, it's hard yeah. on the body. You know, we're just trying to get her to practice like, mm -hmm. you know, 30 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she only dances 12 hours or, or 13 hours a week. But it's hard as a parent to get your kid to do yeah. something that they don't want to do. But what was a typical day for you as a seven, um, eight year old? Yeah, well, like, okay, so in other cultures, <laughs> uh, like um, Russia, China, these more extreme, you know, uh, you use whatever method you have to use. And I personally would not be able to do that, I think, to my own kids is, you know, there's definitely some ramifications and resentment and other negative feelings, uh, which now like, that's a whole other thing that I've been, I think, dealing with now as an adult, um, like the psychological side effects of stuff, you know, but I didn't want to practice. So I was forced to, and I mean, I'm sure people can imagine what, you know, needs to happen to force somebody to do something. Um, and so I, I actually, to be honest with you, Mark, I hated the cello. I hated it until I was maybe like 18. Um, I went to college for music because it was the only way I could go to college because I got offered full scholarships to like multiple schools because, and, but so I was like, okay, I guess if I want to leave home, uh, and try to be free, uh, I have to play the cello. So I was like, fuck, okay, so I'll keep doing that. And that's when I started experimenting with other types of music. Um, but typical day. So my dad would wake me up before the sun came up because, you know, we'd go to school in the morning, we have a lesson every day, one or two lessons a day. Um, lucky me. <laughs> at home music teacher. Uh, so we'd be in the garage and we would play together for usually like an hour, hour and a half. I go to school, come back, uh, practice, usually meals because they were both very, very busy and they work, they still work a lot. So they teach music from home. So we didn't have very many like sit down dinners. Like usually dinner was like micro, literally microwave, but you know, those Tina's burritos. I don't know if you remember them <laughs> at, like this. <laughs> Yeah, like from from yeah you know, from the supermarket, like literally it was just like microwaved frozen food. So I would do that and then go back to practice, homework, practice. And I um was not allowed. I think I saw two movies in movie theaters before I was 18, before I left home. But I've heard you say you didn't have you, you weren't allowed to go on the internet. You yeah, weren't no, allowed no to internet. have any music, any music that wasn't mm -hmm. classical music. So you're like sneaking yeah. 
you know, you're sneaking, sneaking Marilyn Manson's CD in and listening yeah. to it, like, yeah. like with your that, ear that was, up against it <laughs> yeah. and like all that stuff. Like, yeah, that was in sixth grade. I had this crush on this kid named Luke. He was the, the, the school goth. Right. And he wore black lipstick and I just thought he was so weird and cool and different. Um, and so he, he was like, Hey, like, have you ever heard of Marilyn Manson? I'm like, no, who's she? Like, I thought like maybe Marilyn Monroe, <laughs> Marilyn Manson. Uh, I was like, no, you got to check this out. And I did have a boom box that we got at the garage sale from the next door neighbor only like, um, you know the sound it was a really shitty boom box but it worked and so i turned it all the way down to like one right and i put my ear up against the speaker and that's the first time i heard beautiful people and i had never ever i mean you hear stuff on the radio you know like pop music or whatnot but usually they don't play like heavy industrial music on the radio so i just had no exposure and i remember the first time that i heard it it was like some type of like brain orgasm i'm not sure what it was but i just felt like a deep <laughs> not, like not, to, not to not him as a man obviously but like the, yeah. the music the music and, yeah, and the feeling you. yeah it moved me and i'm like what what is this like this is what i want to do like i i mean i can play an instrument but i, I wish i played the guitar i wish i i had a really low voice for a while i was oh, i was like wanting to i'm like i wish i could sing like metal that was like my exposure I, and then i also heard guns and roses appetite for destruction uh, and another cassette tape we had cassette tapes back then um but other than that it was like a very very limited musical uh scope and i remember um system of a down was really big on the radio so that i loved i love system and very grateful that recently, like a year ago, I collaborated with Surge, like on a track. We co-wrote a track, my new album, and I'm like, "What is happening? Like, this is insane." Because I remember, you know, being in middle school, like writing, you know, during a carpool or something, like listening to System, and like now we're doing stuff together and making a video together. You know, it's really, it's really crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. and I told him that too. I'm like, I know I'm acting very calm, but like I'm freaking out inside. <laughs> Why? <laughs> okay, so uh, a, few, a quick question for you: Are you familiar with Beethoven's kind of? story his his youth his uh, growing not, up uh, i mean this is bad but not really yeah not, no and no, no, it's not no. bad the reason yeah. the reason i asked like i like to listen to stuff on audible and i did this one of the great courses on um, from this amazing professor who like just did like the, a breakdown um i wish i remembered his name i feel like it's green or something but anyway he does this breakdown of of beethoven's life and, and how it affected his music but as a five-year-old boy he was like forced to play the piano he right. was woken up his dad or whatever would wake him up in the middle of the night like mm -hmm. out of a deep sleep and say play the mm -hmm. piano and he would they mm -hmm. would like lock him in a cellar if mm -hmm. he didn't play and he was just mm -hmm. like play play mm -hmm. play play mm -hmm. and it allowed him to become one of the most obviously um because he started as i guess not a pianist because back then they had a harpsichord i guess yeah but it yeah. allowed him to be totally young and totally unique mm -hmm. and really gifted at this skill mm -hmm. and once he learned that skill which he did not want to learn which was you know I, some might say in an abusive environment or whatnot mm -hmm. he was able to take that skill and and go off and do all these remarkable things and so yeah. as i was learning about your story mm -hmm. i couldn't help but think okay you can't go back and redo anything you can't change yeah. anything you may I have wished it, it was mm -mm, i wouldn't well, now, now but... looking back i wouldn't change it and i didn't know that actually i thought i don't know why i assumed he was probably just wanted to do it you know like uh, mozart i think was self-instigated but yeah same i my parents did lock me in a room to practice you know and they would let me out um uh, every every i think it was like every hour for a certain number of minutes you know no wonder i track everything now to go pee to go to the bathroom <laughs> to drink water it was very extreme yeah and i i never i have to say i never would have done it and you know the, the what is it the ten thousand hour rule if you don't practice enough if you don't have enough of that muscle memory you just will not be able to i don't know to be able to shred i mean that it is what it yeah. is so whether it's self-instigated or it's forced upon you and having met a lot of people it's not even the music too like when i was in Cirque du Soleil I met so many incredible dancers and acrobats acrobats that come from like uh, dynasties of like you know I mean this is a very niche thing but like um generations of the like the top circus performers and it's all they're all forced to do it you you, you want to call it abusive environment but that's what it is so everybody and, and I, it, yeah. I'm not saying that your environment was abusive or what have you mm -hmm. I do like yeah. I do know so oh oh so it definitely interesting was about... it, it was <laughs> <laughs> what's okay, what's interesting about Beethoven, though, is Mozart was slightly older and, and Beethoven's dad, who was kind of this alcoholic, was constantly running out of money and he fancied himself a musician type person. He fancied himself to be the best. But he saw that Mozart was taking the world by storm. He sees his son, Beethoven, and goes, oh, there's an opportunity here, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. force him to be the next Mozart. And I guess what I struggle with is... 
I am so inspired by you and your story. But I always worry and fear. Like I have the highest hopes and, mm-hmm. and I want to do the most amazing things. But secretly, and this is kind of like... Um, we all, I think, struggle with this. And this is kind of like the, the dark side of me. There's the light side and the dark side. But mm-hmm. the dark side of me worries that maybe I'm a little too lazy. Maybe I'm not disciplined enough. Maybe I'm not consistent enough. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I won't do the hard work I need to do. Maybe I won't take the risks I need to take. Maybe I'll, the moment will come and fear will stop me from mm-hmm. taking that step. And I'm not in your head and I'm not in your heart. But it mm-hmm. seems like you've put in the hard work, you've put in the hours, you have the discipline, you are comfortable taking risks. Like, I want what you've done. We all mm-hmm. do. And yet, I think deep down inside, I'm afraid that I won't do what I need to do to get to mm-hmm. where you are. Mm-hmm. What, what do you make of that? I think everybody has their own path. And I know that sounds maybe very you know general or whatnot, but um, everyone's different. And everything to an extreme can be bad. Um, I myself, I think, took it a little bit too far to the point because it is very extremely stressful. Um, I don't know if everybody talks about it, but of course, when you're that disciplined and hyper focused and obsessive, which I think you have to be obsessive and will sacrifice everything else. You know, I think for many, many years, I don't know if like I don't think my relationships failed in the past because of my focus on my career or whatnot, but it wasn't a conducive environment, I think, to even like really take the time to pick my partners. Sorry, exes. Um, but no, it's just because my so much of my focus. It was really like 99% my career, my music, like everything was focused on that. And sometimes I think like, but you kind of have to to get to a certain point. And I'm not saying I'm, you know, I'm at a point where I feel like I've done everything that I want to do, which I, I'm not. Um, but it's also never ending. You know, when is it enough? And I think uh for for me, I haven't really talked about this too publicly. I think I made a post about it like maybe last year. Um, but it was the first time in my life I actually got super depressed to the point where I mean, I had I was seeing a therapist like three, four times a week. I was on antidepressants, like I got really bad um last year, about six, seven, uh, seven months ago. I just gone off a tour, a long tour, arena tour around Europe. Um, so from the outside, everything, you know, I'm making money. I moved back to LA. I was living in Vegas during the pandemic. Um, but I think for me, it was more about like loneliness. I was like by myself. Um, and I just felt like, wait, what is the point? I'm now I'm like 30, almost 37 at the time. Um, and okay, you know, I have money, I have security. Um, I can always have more, you know, it's never going to be enough. Every time I reach some goal, it's like, okay, there's something else. Um, there has to be something more. And I felt like I did actually get to a point where I kind of lost, it it became more like it tilted towards like money and success more than like my art. And for me, I'm happiest when it's a balance, when truly it's 50, 50. Cause like to me, making money is also an art form. You know, it's a total, it's a different type of art form. Yeah. I think I just became too much about that. And so I, did you notice, how did you, how did you notice or figure out that, that this was off? I mean, other than the fact that maybe you're you're sad and you're depressed and you're apathetic yeah. and all of those well, things. Well, I just felt I just felt I mean, I'm sure it also had to do with the fact that it was the pandemic and then being, you yeah. know, isolated. And I was by because I was engaged before the pandemic and we were gonna get married. It's a long story, but there's some issues, financial issues actually, where um they wouldn't sign a prenup, even though we talked about it, you know, at the last minute. So that was like a whole a whole thing we broke up, which was good because it was the wrong person. But I think because of that whole situation, so I was almost completely by myself, like with my dogs, thank God, but for two years, like in this huge 3,600 square foot house in Vegas, but, and I had just moved there for him. That was like a whole thing. So I was like alone for two years. I mean, I was working on projects, thank God. I'm grateful for Hans too, because we did, you know, Dune, Top Gun. So I was just working. So every day I wake up, um, work out, you know, downstairs in the den in my gym. And then I go to my desk in my office and I would literally be there for 12 to 15 hours. That's all I would do every day. Cause you know, can't go outside. So I was working, so that's good, but I was recording working. And I think I just kind of like, I burned out, you know, I lost all like kind of inspiration, um, artistically, musically, I think also because I was signed to Sony, not because of Sony. I mean, we're still on very good terms, but, um, when you're signed to a label, you know, 
things have to go through an approval process. And so it was really difficult for me to like release anything new or anything experimental because they said, you know, it's kind of crazy <laughs> or that's not marketable. That's not going to sell. Um, so now I think I'm a lot happier because I moved back to LA, you know, it's not the pandemic. All my, all my friends are here. Um, I met somebody wonderful uh, on Hinge, the first person that I went on a, d- a date with here in LA. So that was very lucky. But, and also I think I, I left Sony, you know, so I was able to talk to them directly about it and they let me out of my deal early because I still owe them four albums. I think. And so now I'm back to self-releasing. Um, so I feel a lot more free, I think creatively, and I'm not working seven days a week. I'm working maybe five, six days a week, five days a week sometimes. Um, and for the first time in my life, I actually took a vacation that wasn't related to like music or profit making in some way. Um, so in November of last year with Harley, my boyfriend, we went to Italy uh, and Seattle for three weeks. And to me, that is like insane to spend three weeks yeah. not making money or like not working, not practicing. Um, but I think I realized like that you can't, if you go too hard the other way, it's not good. So now um, I feel, I feel really happy. I feel a lot more balanced. And yeah, I used to be like, again, obsessed with like the numbers, like what I mentioned about reaching these metrics. Um, and if I didn't reach it by a certain date, cause I would literally have like the dates, you know, and if I didn't reach it, I would feel like terrible. I would feel like a loser. Like, Oh my God, like I'm not, uh, what is the point? You know, cause if you get to a point where it's too much in that direction. So it's, it's hard, I think. And because of the way that I was raised, all of my sense of self-worth, it used to be, it really was, was from any success, you know, being given praise. Cause like my parents, and this is not, not special to them. I mean, this is not unique. I think it's a Asian thing not to be racist or whatever, but I can say it cause I'm Asian. So I, 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 I don't you. think it's, I don't think it's <laughs> racist to suggest that different cultures have different values. Yeah. The, the cultural values are on, you know, success on um, being the best. Uh, and I understand, you know, cause especially if you come from like, like me being Chinese, like in a world where if you're not the best, you're completely fucked because there's so many people you're competing against so many people and everyone's like really hardworking and whatnot. So I think, um, having that sense of like, just like constant competition, um, it does, it is helpful. It is useful, but taken a little bit too far. It can also, we all have different breaking points. And I was actually surprised. Like some of my friends told me they're like, no offense, but we're surprised you've like lasted this long without taking a break without like breaking, like literally breaking. So I think I like completely just freaked out for maybe six weeks. And to me, it felt like an eternity, but I guess it was only six weeks. Like when I, I stopped working, I had some shows, I canceled like everything. Like I, I just like could I felt like I like couldn't even function, you know. Operate. Mm-hmm, I couldn't operate. Yeah. So I've been struggling with this too because in 2018 mm-hmm. I built a multi million dollar agency. Mm-hmm. We're pushing, pushing, pushing constantly out of my comfort zone. I grow this thing from like in 2006 when I started. It was me and, mm-hmm. and like a digital camera, mm-hmm. and uh, and I sublet this tiny little office, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we struggled to get by. And and by 2018 again multi million dollar have seven figure payroll. We're doing national television campaigns. We're doing mm-hmm. all this stuff that I feel complete imposter syndrome for totally unequipped to do. It's just like, and it wasn't stuff that I loved, but it just, I felt like, well, that's the next step. That's the next step. And that's the next step. And we got to grow. So I get Mm -hmm. really, really depressed and really down. Mm -hmm. But um, what I've been struggling with since then is I feel like I can be happy Mm -hmm. and at peace and and calm and move slow, Mm -hmm. or I can push really, really hard and be obsessive and be focused. Yeah. But I feel like if I'm really obsessed and focused and push hard, no one wants to be around me and I'm not really Mm -hmm. that happy Mm -hmm. because I'm constantly worried. Mm -hmm. And if I am at peace and and I feel like I'm a better man and a better husband and a better father and a better person to be around, I don't feel like I'm going to get anywhere near the goals or ambitions that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that way? And have you yeah. been able to solve this problem? <laughs> um, actually, yes, I, I do. I completely understand. And I, I guess it's like re, re kind of like, I think realigning what success means to, to us, to you, to me. And for me, it used to mean making as much money as possible, proving to everybody, blah, 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 doing this, doing that, playing in this venue, playing in that venue. But after a while, like not after, like, I, I, I think the highlight for me artistically, musically was playing at back in, it was a hundred, over a hundred thousand people, you know, at the biggest metal festival in the world, on um, like a double stage with, um, you know, with some friends of mine and with their band. And that was in 2019, 2018. I don't remember, but um, so I was able to, you know, that was because originally when I was starting out, that was like my goal was to play metal, um, play at some big festivals or whatever. And like that, I mean, it was incredible, but after you do it, 
then it's like, okay, what's next? Then what? <laughs> yeah, you wanted the million. You got the million. You wanted. Yeah. You want to play in front of hundred thousand people. Yeah. You get it. And then, yeah. and then what, yeah. what else? Right. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, at least for me, it's like, I, I don't have any kids. I don't, I'm still kind of like on the fence. I feel like I'm not, I think for so long, I was just focused on my career where I'm like, I, you know, as a woman too, like you have to actually, you know, get pregnant and do all that stuff. I'm like, I can't, like, I can't afford it time-wise, you know? And so now like, I'm, I'm thinking about that. Cause like, you know, I'm 37, so I don't want to wait too much longer, but I still don't feel like I'm ready because I feel like there's more that I want to experience, but not not for like making money or a career. Like I, I realized I'm like, I haven't lived my life. I didn't have a childhood. I haven't like I took my first vacation, what, in November and it's January. So two months ago. So I actually now I feel like it's most important. Your mental health is most important. Um, it's important that I feel balanced and happy. I still want to work hard, of course. Um, but maybe it's not necessary to grind to the point where, cause I'm not broke anymore. I'm, I'm not going to like die if I don't get, you know, if I don't take the next gig. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing that. And I'm also actually focused more on uh, expanding outside of just playing the cello. So I've always obviously been really interested in business entrepreneurship. Um, I recently, I haven't announced it yet. Cause like we, you know, we're going to wait a little bit, but I joined the board of like a really cool, really great company. Like we have our first all hands, everybody meeting um, in a couple of days, you know, Burbank at the office, like from nine to five. And I don't know, I've always fantasized about like, you know, it's always the opposite. Like, I fantasize about being in a corporate environment. And I know people who like work and I'm like, I mean, yeah, yeah. they're like, they're like, give me, <laughs> well, and, and being yeah. part of a board of a startup in, in Burbank probably isn't the most corporate of corporate environments. I mean, you're not going into like insurance or banking, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. But I mean, it's still, it's like an established company. They've got music tech related and they've been around for a while. Yeah. So, um, but we're, yeah. And it's like, that's, that to me is exciting because it's something new. It's a new challenge. I think, I think I'll grow intellectually, you know, in other areas. And then, yeah, I still have, I'm leaving for Dubai in a couple of days to go play a couple of shows with Hans. Like we're doing that. We're filming like the new DVD or whatever. I think it's coming out to Netflix or where, you know, wherever, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever streaming network you set up. So it's a, I think it's a good balance now. So to answer your question, um, I think you can find that balance. You know, I, for me, if I, I think if I had children, I would rather be slightly better parent than, than, I don't know, make a couple million more. Cause in the end, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't take it with you to say, but yeah. um, so, so it seems to me if I were to create a course and, and mm -hmm. I were to have you like on my course and I'd be analyzing your life and your career and the steps. So, so I'm going to just take a third party view for a second. It seems mm -hmm. to me that that first an incredible amount of hard work and dedication to build a skill set, mm -hmm. And then you, you took that, that skill set. you know, there's a, I was saying to someone on my team, there are a ton of people who play the cello. Yeah. Like the classical cello in symphonies. And, and you might be the best or you might be pretty good. I don't know. But mm -hmm. you had this drive and desire to want to do your thing and to shred a cello like an electric guitar sound. <laughs> and I was, I was thinking to myself, like, don't you think the average person would probably just, you know, you went from piano to cello, you'd put the cello down and learn how to play guitar. But, mm -hmm. but if you learned how to play a guitar to get that sound, you would at best be one of a million people who can play a guitar that way. And so you took the skill set you had, mm -hmm. you took your interests and your passions, and you figured out a way to try and smash these two things together. Mm -hmm. And then you took risk after risk after risk in terms of scraping to get by and taking all these $50 things here and $50 things there that took you two or three years to build up enough of an ability, you know, you know, you're meeting people who introduce you to this person and that person, you're building up your network, you're, you're, you're ready to take your one shot at this creative <laughs> thing. And if it didn't work out, I imagine you would have taken a second shot and a third shot and a fourth shot, because you don't seem like the type of person to give up. Mm -hmm. But after you did all of that skill set building, and then you combined your interest with with what you were great at, and you scraped to get by and you took your shot, from then on, it seemed like network, hard work, being a professional, showing up and doing what you need to do mm -hmm. has really been the last 10 years of your life and career. Would, would, is, is all that accurate, you think? Or is there more to uh, it? Kind of. You know, I didn't mention all the failed fan projects that I had like prior to that video. Like I had 
four or five different band projects. So I was doing a lot of stuff at the same time. I tried, I tried to have my own metal band. I tried to have like other projects that I was in an all girl group, disaster, disastrous. Um, and I think, you know, so after that first video, you know, saving, doing stuff, when you say networking, like I always say, I, I've used the dangle the carrot method because a lot of musicians, they try to network by going to like events. They spend so much time like going out and schmoozing. Um, it's, I actually have never done that. I have a kind of like, not, not, not to say it's bad because everybody has their own method, but I kind of don't, I don't personally don't like doing that, you know, because I feel like if, if uh, we're talking about a carrot and there's all these rabbits, you know, which are your potential buyers and you're shoving your carrot in their mouth, in their mouth, like, oh, take my carrot, take my carrot. For me, I automatically, like if somebody's like that with me, I'm like, oh, like it's just because you lower, uh, I think the perceived value too, but you lower your own value by giving out an energy of like desperation. So for me, like my, it's not really networking, maybe it's like social networking, but um, I would say it's branding or marketing, right? Um, I've always focused on, okay, so if I have, if I've allocated whatever, two, two $3,000, right? Um, to put into some type of musical thing for myself, a music video, I do it because I love it. But I also think it's a, it's a calling card. It's a business card, right? And I just think all the people that could watch it, um, you never know who can see your stuff. And then you get called for potential like corporate things or brand partnerships and stuff like that. So that's how I've always operated. Um, I don't, I've never reached out to anyone. Like I don't, reach out to people. It's always like the other way in. And so what I focus on, I always tell people like focus on yourself, on your own product, on your own brand, because when it's interesting enough, people will come. And when people approach you, you automatically, your negotiation power is like you start off at like a higher, um, at a higher position. Um, I'm not saying it's the right way, but like that was, that's one thing that I'm really like, I've never done the traditional networking thing. And I know people do that, you know, like I get emails and stuff all the time from, and I have to say, like, I never read any of them, not to be an asshole, but it's like, I, I just don't like, you don't have time. Um, and a lot of times I know with like my composer friends, a lot of aspiring composers, musicians, they'll send their music or I have people, you know, back in the day when people used to use CDs, which is only like a few years ago. It's like now nobody has CDs anymore. Um, you know, they bring you your CD backstage and like, it goes straight in the trash and not just because you're an asshole, but it's for liability reasons. If you listen to their music and then you write something or something comes out, they can claim, you know, Oh, it's a copyright violation or they copied my music. Or So it's like for various reasons, it's not, I don't know. That's one thing I always tell, like uh, if I have like clients, not consultation clients, you know, that uh, I work with to help build their brand. I might be wrong, but I don't think. Yeah, so so you do, like, you do your yeah. own thing and you, I do my and you focus an incredible yeah. amount of time and then you let people yeah. come to you. So yeah. I know you've done yeah. a lot of brand, brand, mm -hmm. uh, you know, branding opportunities and right. even, I mean, even Hans and all these other people, they came mm -hmm. to you, you did your thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but then, then they worked with you time and time and time again. Right. And they referred you here and they referred you there and off you went. I mean, yes, the circus yeah. came to you and, and the right. movies came to you and all these things right. came to you. But when I say yeah. network, I guess I didn't mm -hmm. mean necessarily the networking, but it's more right, like there's right. this group of people who turn to you, trust you and give you, yes. you, know, yeah. give you a shot. And then once right. you get your right. shot, you better show up and exactly. deliver, right? Yeah. Always over delivery, right? What, what do they say? Under promise uh, and over deliver. I always try to over deliver, like always give a little bit more than necessary, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for you, final question for the conversation at the end of the day, mm -hmm. knowing all you've done and where mm -hmm. you've been, and even this conversation we just had now in terms of like taking a vacation, and all those things, <laughs> but for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? For me as a human being, mm -hmm. um, love, feeling Love? safe. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Um, and I, I think for such a long time, I wasn't focused on that just because I didn't experience a lot of it growing up because a family environment that wasn't about like, I mean, even now it's like, I think a couple times, like my parents, I was like hugged awkwardly, but it's just not like a cultural thing. Like you're the purpose of a parent is to breed, you know, humans that are high performing, you know, it's kind of, it's a very different focus. And I think for me, I was lacking that because I'm actually very, uh, very soft and fluffy on the inside, you know? And so I think um, for me, that's really important, but also uh, self-actualization still. But now I think I'm more mature. I've maturated and I realize like self-actualization is not just about your, your, you know, your net worth. There's more to that. It's like in every, every way. So balance, you know, being happy and being able to, you know, I mean, money isn't everything, right. But everything costs money. So uh, I do like nice things. I want to have experiences and whatnot. So it's just about balance. And I think um, it's different for everybody. And 
I used to be a lot more judgmental too. If I, if I met somebody that I felt like was lazy, like I would, I mean, to be honest, I would like look down at them like, oh, you know, it's like survival of the fittest. Like, what are you doing? And not like, be, but now I realize it's not, it doesn't matter. You know, it's just whatever everyone's different. So whatever makes you happy or what makes you feel balanced and fulfilled. Um, I think I'm maybe just a little bit more extreme. So I need more of certain things, but so I'm going to go for it. <laughs> Keep going until I'm dead. And then I'll feel good because I'm like, I did everything I wanted to do and I tried everything I wanted to try. Mm-hmm.